going to go to God's Word right now. We're going to go to the message that uh, we're going to be looking at the, the first of the uh, aspects of our mission statement. Now, when you walked in, there's a big banner up there on the beam that says receiving, sharing, and giving. Receiving, sharing, and giving. And we're going to look at that first aspect of the uh, receiving part and how that applies to us as a, a fellowship so that we know that God's word is relevant and, and speaks into our life. I'm thankful this church has a mission statement, that we have a focus, we have direction, and we know that we can be moving forward. How many of you want to move forward and not backward? Okay, I think I see every hand up. That's encouraging, because as your pastor, I want to lead you forward. I want to advance in the name of Jesus. But you know what? It's one thing to say, charge, and go out, but if nobody's following, there's a problem. Okay, so we need to go together, right? All right, okay, well, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. Now, you have a little outline in your bulletin. And again, that's for you to take notes and, and to reflect upon and review during, during the week. Well, the first aspect on that, uh, that first point on that outline is God is faithful. Say that with me. God is faithful. Faithful. Okay, we're going to get that up on the screen there, so you can uh, have that to, to write down. We know that God is faithful, and we see in the Old Testament his, uh, a demonstration of his faithfulness. So take your Bibles. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, where we see uh, right up front God's faithfulness. Now, when you think of Abraham, let me just ask you, what thoughts come to your mind? Abraham. Okay, you think of his son Isaac, the son of promise. Okay, what else do you think of when you think of Abraham? Obedience, sacrifice. Yeah, remember when he was, God asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And, and the obedience. Okay, there's a lot of different things we think about. He is the father of our faith, says the word of God. Abraham is a very important person in God's plan. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Let's read a couple verses there, verses 1 through 4 and then 6 through 8. And let's just get a little idea of what God's doing here to show his faithfulness. Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, leave. Ooh, now that's a strong word. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household. And go to the land of I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a what? Blessing. blessing. We're recipients of that blessing here today. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I'm one of the all peoples. So are you. God worked his divine plan through Abraham. Go with me to verse 6. Here's the obedience part. God gave the command to leave, to go, and here's what happens in verse 6. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward Abraham. East, the east hill, the hills east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built a what? An altar to who? The to the Lord. And called on the name of the Lord. Okay, we're going to end the reading right there. So what we see happening is God comes and he says to Abraham, I'm asking you to leave everything that's comfortable, everything that you've known, and to follow me, and to go wherever I call you to go. That was to be a step of faith. God came and revealed himself to Abraham. Abraham was a pagan. He worshipped idols, just like his father, Tara, did. He had been brought up that way. But God appeared to him, and God spoke to him, and God divinely intervened and said, I've chosen you to be part of my plan, and now I'm calling you to follow me. That's a very serious call, and Abraham had a choice. 
He could stay where it was comfortable, stay with his father's household, stay with everything that he knew, or let go and let God lead him to wherever God would take him. Wow. Abraham was faithful. So we read in the scripture that when he went and God led him and God again revealed himself to him, he built an altar. That altar was to declare God is faithful. God has made himself known to me. Now I'm one of his and I'm going to worship God. When he built that altar, it was an act of worship. I see it as, as Abraham saying, Lord, I'm offering myself to you. As I build this altar, as I sacrifice and worship you, I'm offering myself to you. Take all of me. Take all of me. Aren't you glad Abraham was obedient? Boy, I sure am. What a powerful illustration for us when God speaks to us that we too say, God, take all of me. I don't want to hold back anything. I want to be faithful and follow wherever you call me to go. There's power, there's peace, there's joy. And to be in the will of God, well, there's nothing greater in all the world. Amen? Amen. Now, from the Old Testament, we know that throughout the Old Testament, there are so many other examples of God's faithfulness, God coming to specific individuals, revealing himself, speaking to them, and they're responding in faith. Now, not all responded in faith. Some did not choose to obey the Lord and his voice. They went their own way, and there were consequences. But we have the record of those. We have Moses and Joshua. We have Daniel. We, we have so many others who heard the word of God coming to them, the voice of God speaking to them, and they responded in faith. God was faithful to come to them. Now, if we go to the New Testament, we see that um, in John <clears throat> chapter 12, Jesus comes on the scene. Now, when you think of Jesus, what kind of thoughts go through your mind? Savior, we just came through Christmas, and we, we know that we sang about Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us, or God has come to us. In other words, we're declaring God is faithful. God did not leave us in our helpless, hopeless condition of sin. No, God came to us in love, and he gave himself to us. Emmanuel, God coming to us. Now, Jesus makes a statement, and it's in John chapter 8, verse 12, and we're going to have that up on the screen there for us to just take a look at. John 8, verse 12, Jesus makes a statement. I'm going to go ahead and read it for you. I am the light of the world. Okay, here it is. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am, this is Jesus speaking, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in what? darkness but will have the light of life okay now i want to just pause right here and i want to ask you who knows what the brightest strongest beam of man-made light in the world is who knows what this beam and it exists today somewhere in the world there's a beam that it is the brightest man-made light that has ever been produced who knows what that is? Laser. Say it again. Laser. It's a laser, but, it, but, but it, it's not, it's a specific light. It's not a, a laser per se, but it's a specific light. And it's shining right now. It, it, it's, it, well, not, maybe it's not on right now because it's, it's light. But, you know, when it gets dark, it, 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 it's, it's shining. Lexer. Who said it? Lexer. Lexer, yes, over in Las Vegas. Our, our son is a youth pastor in Las Vegas. And, and when, when we go there to visit them at night... You know, even though their house is like 15 miles outside of uh, the Las Vegas casino area, here's this beam of light. Now, I think we have a picture of it that we can put up on the screen here. There it is. There's the light. And do you know that is 42.3 billion candlelight? 42.3 billion candlelight. And it's 39 lamps that are 7,000 watts each, and they all converge to make one beam, which you see there, 
And do you know that the astronauts from space can see this beam as they're circling our globe? Airline pilots use it as, as a landmark. Uh, you know, if their instruments aren't working right, well, they just look for the laser beam, that, that sky beam, to show them which direction they're to be in. It is the brightest man-made light that has ever been produced, and, you know, it, it's still operating. Now, we all know this is, this is uh, it, it's a manufactured light. And, and if there were to be a power outage, let's say Hoover Dam had a problem and the electricity wasn't produced, what would happen to the Lexer sky beam? Well, it, it would no longer be there. It would be dark. Okay, you, they, they wouldn't have the beam going up anymore. Okay, it's manufactured. It's limited. And it's only one location. And yet we're in awe that 42 billion candlelight is going up in, in this beam. As somebody said, you could read a newspaper from 10 miles out in space. I mean, if, if you were out there hanging in space with a newspaper, you could read it by the light of that beam. Isn't that amazing? Now think about this. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. His light is supernatural because he is God. Not created by man, it is a God thing. His light shines. Now, he makes a statement. You see, originally, Jesus called 12 to follow him. We call them the 12 apostles. And he said simply to them, as they were uh, with the fishermen uh, in the boats or where, whatever they happened to be doing at the tax collector booth, he said, come, follow me. Uh, a very simple invitation. But he was calling these men to step out in faith, and to follow him. See, as God, he was faithful to reach out to them. Now they needed to respond in faith and obedience. But here, Jesus is saying in our scripture, whosoever, that includes all people. It wasn't limited to just the 12. It began there, but then Jesus extended the invitation to all people. Whosoever will follow, will be Whosoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. You see, God is able to come to anyone at any time and speak into their life. Now, a couple days ago, I received the Christianity Today new, uh, magazine. I was reading through here, and, and something got my attention uh, what got my attention was an article about General Butt Naked. I don't know if you've ever heard of General Butt Naked, but he, is a, uh, he was a warlord in Africa. And uh, Christianity Today uh, writes about him. Uh, the bishop of the, the church there in, in that specific area uh, of Liberia was discussing uh, this general who used to go into the battlefield naked. And that's why he was called General Butt Naked. But he led the troops. Sad to say, during the, uh, the West African uh, Civil War between the years 1989 to the year 2003, this general is responsible for 20,000 deaths. 20,000 deaths. Now, the gruesome thing is, this man, I can't pronounce his name, it's an African name. He not only killed 20,000 people during this civil war, but when he entered into battle naked and he killed someone, he used to cut out their heart and he eat it. Now that's gross, isn't it? I don't know, can we talk about things like that? It, it shows the depravity of humanity, doesn't it? At its worst, here was this man who, would, who ate his victims' hearts. Now, this man heard the voice of God Almighty speaking to him, and he repented of his sin. He gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and now he is serving Jesus as a witness of God's power to save anybody. God is able to save anybody. No one is beyond hope. See, God is faithful to come and make himself known. Now, this general who is now a pastor and, and reaching out, he is going, he is seeking out 
survivors to ask their forgiveness. And the, the Christianity Today says his record so far, 19 of 77 have forgiven him. This man who was such a brutal beast, put, to put it honestly, I mean, he was a savage. When he came to Jesus, he was totally transformed by the power of God and the Holy Spirit brought him to a place of being born again. Totally transformed. Now he's a new creation in Jesus Christ. He's serving Jesus. He's doing the God thing by going to those families and asking forgiveness. Imagine how painful that must be. You know, I had to ask forgiveness for John for forgetting him last week. I mean, it's like, yeah, that, I, I, how could I have done that? But I did. Not intentionally, but it happened. But to think of this man now having to go and do that. But see, that's what God is calling him to do. A changed life is evident. A changed heart is evident by a changed life. I'm going to say that again. A changed heart is evident by a changed life. This man had a visitation by God. God is faithful. And he chose to obey, just like Abraham chose to obey, just like the disciples chose to obey, just like many others over the centuries have chosen to obey God's voice speaking to them and reaching out to them and letting them have a changed life now and for how long? Forever. The eternity factor. Okay, number two on your, bullet, on your outline there. We are to be faith-filled. Faith-filled. God is faithful. He comes to us. There's divine intervention. Now, we are to be faith-filled. Take your Bibles. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, we know this chapter uh, as the faith chapter, or the heroes of the faith. Hebrews chapter 11. Here we have a, a list of, of all those uh, heroes of the faith. And, and the list goes on and on. It, it begins with Abel, there's Enoch, there's Noah, there's Abraham, uh, there's Isaac, there's Joseph, Moses, and the list goes on and on and on. The heroes of the faith. Again, we have to recognize within these transformed lives, God's divine intervention. He was faithful to come and call these individuals, along with everyone else, to come follow him. Now, what makes the difference? Verse 6, here's the key for us. Verse 6 tells us, And without faith, here's the key word, without faith, it is impossible. Now, that's a pretty strong word, isn't it? That means there's no possibility without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to what? Please God. Because anyone, there's the everyone, whosoever, anyone... Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he, is, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Okay, so when God calls us to himself in his faithfulness, we are responsible to respond by believing him, putting our faith in him, and earnestly what? Seeking him. See, it's a walk in the light of God. As Jesus said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but walk in light. You need to walk it out. You need to walk out your faith. God is pleased when he looks into my heart and your heart and he sees true faith in him. And he is the living and true God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has revealed himself to us so that we might have changed lives, changed forever. You see, we look at these heroes of the faith and we recognize that they were faithful to follow. Abraham, in uh, Genesis 15, verse 6, Scripture tells us, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him for righteousness. One of your translations says it was accounted unto him. In other words, God saw his faith and he said, there's a, 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 a faithful, a faith-filled person who is believing me and belongs to me and now my righteousness is over them now this was way before jesus came and died on the cross and paid for our sin uh, by his death 
was buried and then arose again so that we might have the righteousness of God, which we talked about last week. You see, Abraham's faith in God, God credited it to him or accounted it to him for righteousness. In other words, God says, now you're part of my forever family. I've received you into the kingdom of God. It's so important, my friends, that we too recognize the importance of being faith-filled, having faith in the one true God. We've talked in the past about all the false gods that are out there and all the false beliefs, and there will be more that come on the world scene. That's why we need to be rooted and grounded in God's word, amen? Amen. We need to know the truth and walk in the truth because there's a lot of deception out there that would like to lead us astray. But we need to follow Jesus in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. We need to walk in the light lest the darkness consume us and lead us astray when the trials and the troubles and the tribulations of this world come before Jesus returns. We saw that last week in Matthew 24. We need to be prepared. We need to be growing in our faith. We need to be keeping our eyes on Jesus. Now, if you have come to faith in Jesus, you have a faith story. I have a faith story. Now, most of you don't really know me. You've gotten to know Vivian and myself over the past couple months, but you don't really know the story of how God worked in my life. I want to tell you that story Because I'm also going to ask you to share your story. In your bulletin, there was a little sheet that said, My Faith Story. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're walking in the light, you have a faith story. God has spoken to you and you've responded. Now you're living in the light of that. You see, I grew up in a Christian home. Christian grandparents, Christian parents. I went to church twice on Sunday. Sunday morning, Sunday evening. I learned the catechism. I could answer the questions of the Heidelberg Catechism. I went to Christian school. I was surrounded with Christianity. I could even quote you the Bible. I knew Psalm 23. I knew Luke 2. I I, I knew a, a number of Bible passages from memory. I knew the Bible, and I knew about God. But I did not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I even went to a Christian High school, Maranatha Christian High School. Met in a little church in San Gabriel, California. Same town that I was born in. One week when I was a junior in high school was the annual spiritual emphasis week. And on that week, the principal had different people come in to share their testimony, their faith story. What God had done in their life hoping that it would be an inspiration to the students and that the Holy Spirit would would work through those testimonies to to touch our hearts. Well, I don't know who came on Monday. I don't even remember, but I remember Tuesday because Tuesday, some really weird-looking people walked in to the chapel. And I sat kind of towards the back because I kind of wanted to be with the cool guys, you know, way in the back, just kind of, we could just do our own thing while everybody else was having chapel. And these three people walked in with long clothes, long hair. They were hippies. And, I, you know, Southern California, I'd seen hippies before. I thought, what in the world are the hippies doing here? Well, these were Jesus people. Jesus people. I see in Christianity today that a, a new book has just come out called The Forever Family. It's about the Jesus people. I don't know, maybe one of you were part of the Jesus people movement. Well, anyway, these three Jesus people walked in. Two gals and a guy. I can still see them walking up on stage, and I laughed. I laughed. Not out loud. I mean, I didn't want to be rude. I didn't want, you know, one of the teachers to come and twist my ear or something. Uh, But I laughed inside. I thought, what a joke. What a circus. You know, what's this about? And they began sharing their faith story, how Jesus reached out to them, how Jesus spoke to them, and how Jesus called them to follow him. As they were sharing, the Holy Spirit spoke to Pete Batches. And he said, they have what you need. Hey, wait a minute. I know the Heidelberg Catechism. 
I go to church twice on Sunday, youth group. I, I know, I've got it all. I've got this thing taken care of. But the Holy Spirit could look into my heart. They have what you need. Now, after the chapel was over, you know, there was opportunity for some of the students to go up and talk with these freaky people. And uh, some of them did, mostly girls. You know, the girls like to ask questions, and they're curious. But, you know, I was a little bit curious myself. And, and I didn't go up and ask questions, but I kind of hung off on the side, just kind of listening, just kind of wanting to hear a little bit more what, what was going to be said. And then I went to class, and, you know, life went on. Well, Wednesday came, and Thursday came, and I don't know who spoke. It didn't make any difference, didn't impact me. I was in the back, you know, with my buddies, being cool. And then on Friday, two students from Azusa Pacific University, right down there in Southern California, not too far from our school, they came, two guys. And I thought, okay, what am I going to hear now? You know, it's like, I, I had an attitude. I'm sorry. I just had an attitude. It wasn't a good attitude. It was a sarcastic attitude because, hey, I had this Jesus. I, I, I had the, the church thing down. I had the Christianity thing down. I didn't have the Jesus thing down. I'll be honest with you. But I didn't care. I, I was in. At least I thought I was in. Well, these two guys got up there and they said, you know, this week, you students have heard a lot of people share their testimony and how God has changed their life, what Jesus has done, and, and you know, what they were and what they are now. And, and they said, we're not even going to share our testimony. You've heard enough. We're just going to simply give opportunity for anybody who wants to put their faith in Jesus Christ, turn their life over to him, and be born again to just get up and stand up and say, I'm doing that. I, I'm putting my faith in Jesus. So we're going to let you do that right now. Go ahead, anybody. Anybody who wants to accept Jesus, right here, now's the time. Well, you know, that kind of shocked me. I was prepared to hear, you know, yada, 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 yada. You know, same old, same old. But these guys said, no, this is come to Jesus time. One girl stood up, one of my classmates, and she was crying. Why do girls like to cry? <laughs> it's just, you know, emotional. Come on, get a life, girl. That's, that was my attitude. And another girl got up and said, I'm committing my life to Jesus today. You know, I need my sins forgiven. I, I've heard what the others have said, and that's what I want. And then I started shaking. And I tell you, I was shaking. And I was holding on to the seat, my chair, shaking. I, I, was, I was literally going like this. And the next thing I knew, I was standing up, and I was looking at all my classmates And this was decision time. Because the Holy Spirit had said to me very clearly, very distinctly, if you were to die today, you would go to hell. See, that's what got me shaken. That second girl sat down. Everything was quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And then the Holy Spirit speaks just to Pete Batches. If you were to die today, you would go to hell. I don't know if that would get you shaking, but it got me shaking. And I realize this is decision time. Because I could die today. I've had friends that have died as teenagers. And the Holy Spirit came upon me mightily. And that's when I stood up. I looked at all my classmates and I said, Today I'm accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm putting my faith in Him. And I'm not turning back. And then I sat down. And then there were many, many, many more. In fact, we canceled all classes that day because revival broke out in Little Maranatha High School because the Holy Spirit was working. I have not turned back. I have been walking that path with Jesus. That's why I'm here today. I don't know where I would be today if I had said, I don't care if I die today and go to hell. I, you know, I just want to live my life for myself. I want to be my own God. I want to do my own thing. I want to control my own life. I don't know where I would be today. I'd probably be dead. I really probably would. But by God's grace, I stand before you today as one to whom I can say God is faithful. He's spoken. He's enabled. By grace, I'm saved through faith. It's the gift of God. I believe you too have a faith story. 
I'd like to give you opportunity. Maybe that little sheet is not long enough. Take a big sheet. Take several sheets. Would you write down your faith story as evidence that you're faith-filled? As God's word says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Would you write it down and would you turn it in next week or maybe the following week? I would love to read your faith stories and, and be encouraged. That brings us to the third point. We are to be faithful. God is faithful. We're to be faith-filled. We are to be faithful. How many of you already guessed that line? You already filled it in. Okay, a few of you have gotten ahead of me in the past weeks and you've been you know, filling those lines in and, and uh, I, I'm glad. I, I want to keep this simple. Uh, I don't want to, you know, try to trick anybody but I want to give us the main thing and the main thing is God is faithful we are to be faith filled and we are to walk in faithfulness now I want to I want to have you hear the testimony of someone who was a Jesus hater oh he was a Jesus hater he just oozed with hate for Jesus he did anything in his power to eliminate the name of Jesus or anyone associated with the name of Jesus. And this went on for a time, and it brought great persecution to the first century church. We read about it in the book of Acts. This Jesus hater had a mission. He thought he was doing God's work. He was on God's mission, stamping out these Jesus people. Until he met Jesus, where? on the road to Damascus. That changed his life forever. And aren't we glad? Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Let's let the Apostle Paul, who was then known as Saul, let's let him just speak for himself about the importance of being faithful. Philippians chapter 3, and let's just begin at verse 7. Here's what Paul says. But, who, but whatever... Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. In other words, I've given up everything for the sake of Jesus. I've let go of it all for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, what is more? I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of what? Knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Wow, there it is. It's the knowing. That's the faith part. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. See, that was the issue. Paul thought he was righteous in and of himself. He was a Pharisee. He was a Jew. He was a son of Abraham. He knew the Torah. He knew he had it all together. He had the thing put together in his mind, but he didn't know Jesus. Same as Pete Batches. Same thing. Self-righteous. Oh, terrible person. Terrible. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but which comes through, you say it, faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Now here's Paul's testimony. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. You see, Paul was saying, he totally transformed my life. I'm no longer the same person. I just want to know him and know him and know him. I want to keep knowing him until the day I see him in all his glory before the throne of God. I have a passion burning within my spirit that nothing and no one can put out. And Paul lived it out, didn't he? Yeah, you read the New Testament. You'll see how Paul lived out his passion of being faithful to the living and true God. Now, I need to ask myself, is that my passion? I need to ask you, as the body of believers, is that your passion to know Christ and the power of his resurrection? To keep knowing him? To keep seeking him? Earnestly, as Hebrews eleven six 6 says, earnestly? Earnestly means that I just put everything behind me and let... Christ be all. Colossians 1 says Christ is all. But am I going to let him be all in my life? That's a daily choice. That's a daily walk. God is calling us to be faithful. You see, this church is full of miracles. Full of miracles. I'm a miracle by the grace of God. 
Faith in Jesus Christ, as Paul said. I believe this congregation is made up of people that are they're miracle people because of what God has done. Are we willing to share God's great work in rescuing us, redeeming us, and reconciling us? I'd like for you just to say with me, I'm God's miracle. Go ahead, say it out loud. I'm God's miracle. One more time. I'm God's miracle. What would happen if you woke up tomorrow morning, Monday, cloudy, rainy, wind blowing, whatever's going on, even if the power's out, electricity's out, and you say, I'm God's miracle, and then you get out of bed? Do you think your day might be a little different? Do you think the Holy Spirit might help you to walk that path in the light of God for the glory of God by saying, I'm God's miracle, because you're declaring the truth. It's by grace that we're saved through faith. It's the gift of God. It's God's miracle, folks. But Satan wants to try to pound us down. Oh, you have nothing to live for. Oh, you've got all these problems. Oh, your family, look at that. The world's so bad. Everything's bad. Well, are we going to believe the devil's lie? Or are we going to believe that Jesus is Lord and that we're God's miracle. Yeah. If we believe it, we need to say it. We need to say it. Wow. Okay. Pretty soon at our annual meeting, you're going to vote on whether I should be ordained by this church in the Christian churches. I've been ordained in four different denominations. And by the grace of God, I've been faithful to Jesus in all of those different fellowships, denominations. Now, you're going to have the privilege of voting whether I should be ordained within the Christian churches at our annual meeting. It's very simple, but it's very significant. But, but you need to know whether I'm really called to ministry, right? Before you can vote on me, you need to know whether I'm called. Well, in 1973, I accepted the assignment of being a minister, a student minister in Shenandoah National Park. That's way on the other side, East Coast, Virginia, up in the Appalachian Mountains, Blue Ridge Parkway. I accepted that assignment. It was with the ministry, a Christian ministry in the national parks. And I left Calvin College in Grand Rapids and drove my car to Virginia. There I met the man who I'd be working for. I'd be a short order fry cook in a little uh, place there on the Skyline Drive, living in a little log cabin. You know, with all the critters and everybody. And, and, and the little campground, two miles away, Matthew's Arm Campground is where I'd be doing the 8.30 and 10 o'clock worship service in the amphitheater for any of the campers, anybody who was there. Well, one Sunday morning, when I got before the people, there's just a handful of people, maybe a dozen, 15 people gathered there in the amphitheater. The sun was just coming up through the trees, Light beams were just shining. Deer were right there. I mean, that, that's, you, you can imagine how peaceful and how beautiful it was. Before I got up to welcome the people to our worship, the Holy Spirit said very clearly to Pete Batches, you are going to be preaching Jesus the rest of your life. Whew, I just melted. I started crying. You know, I talked about them girls crying. Hey, <laughs> I was crying, folks. Uh, tears were streaming. I heard the voice of God distinctly calling me to be a servant of Jesus by pastoring and preaching the gospel till my dying breath, till I breathe no more and I go home to Jesus. Now, I tell you, those people sitting there must have wondered, what's going on with that young guy? I was only 19 years old. They must have wondered, has he lost it? Is he having a nervous breakdown? What's going on? But after I was able to gain my composure. I read the opening scripture and we went on. Now, I don't know why I didn't share with those people what the Holy Spirit had just told me, but I, I, it was a little frightening. It was a little overwhelming. But as I reflect upon it, that was my beginning. I never questioned my call into ministry. And when I've gone through hard times and all pastors do go through hard times and face challenges and Satan comes in and tries to feed me with the lies, I go back to when the Holy Spirit said, you're going to be preaching Jesus the rest of your life. You see, you need to know 
that my call is from God and it's genuine and I've been able to live that out by the grace of God. I want to be faithful to the end. I want to finish well. And I am so very, very, very thankful it was in God's plan to bring Pete and Vivian Batches here to this community, to this church. My heart is full of joy. The challenge for all of us is when God speaks, will we obey? And God speaks in many different ways. God speaks through his word. Amen? That's why as your pastor, I encourage you, read the word. That's why when I have a sermon, I have scriptures up there. And, and you can take notes and you can go back during the week and read the word and read the word. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Maybe he will speak through the message, but maybe he is saying, now you take it the next step and you go further and you let me speak to you through my word and through the spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks when we're in prayer. You may be taking a walk along the beach. You may take a walk along the woods. And I just want to say, yesterday when I was in here preparing for uh, the worship, I felt the Lord say, if anybody at any time wants to come in here and pray, you call me up. You call me on my cell phone, call me on my home phone, I'll open those doors and you can have time with God right here. If you feel you need to come here and just be alone with the Lord. You have the blessing, the privilege to do that. But see, when you seek him, you're going to find him. When you go to his word, when you spend time in prayer, you're going you're to experience God's voice speaking to you. God may speak to you in a time of repentance when you've fallen into sin and you're guilty and you know it and you just get down before the Lord and say, God, forgive me. I, yeah, I messed up again, but I know you're a merciful God and I know I'm your child, I'm your miracle. Please forgive me of this and I want to restore fellowship and God will speak to you. He will reassure you that his blood covers you. When we come to communion very shortly, we're going to give testimony of that. See, I believe living in faithfulness means that we gather in corporate worship just like we are here today. We need this. God says we need it. I believe that when we join together in praise and prayer, this past Thursday we had our first praise and prayer in here. It was a powerful time of just coming before the Lord, just pouring out our love to Him and listening and, and offering our prayers, letting God's Word speak. I left here so refreshed Thursday night, I was probably three feet off the ground when I got out of here. It was like, God, it is so wonderful to be in your presence and to hear you speak. The opportunities for spiritual growth. We have our discovery classes coming up. We have the small groups here, the TLC groups. We, we have the men's study on Wednesday with Dan. We have the women's study on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. These are opportunities to hear God. And while you're going through your lesson on the book of Mark, as the men are, or through Gideon and studying him, you're going to hear God. He's going to speak to you. He's going to ask you to be open and obedient to follow where he leads. I believe another time is when you hear God saying, you need to be baptized. Romans 6, Paul talks about being immersed, going down, being buried with Christ, and coming up, being raised with him for the glory of God. If any of you have never been baptized, water baptized. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to pursue that with you. I believe God honors that. God's word says we are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's be obedient. Bringing your first fruits, your tithes, your offerings as an act of worship. You don't do it begrudgingly. Oh, no, I'm, here I go. I got to give it. No, this is glory to God time. This is glory to God. He's been faithful I'm a witness, I'm his miracle, he's provided for me, and I'm going to return that tithe to him and let God do whatever God wants to do for his glory to advance his kingdom. I believe that partaking of the Lord's Supper is an act of obedience where God is saying, I'm going to speak to you as you come with a heart that is seeking me, devoted to me. I expect God to speak to me every time I partake of the elements together with you. You see, there's many ways that God may want to speak to us. We need to be open and obedient. I'd like for us just to go to communion right now. I'm just sensing the Lord is, is saying, I just want to have us be still. Uh, close your eyes, bow your heads with me. Just be still in his presence. And, and let the Holy Spirit speak in a still, small voice. And, and prepare our hearts to just come and receive what God has provided for us. 
As we partake of this meal, we're declaring Jesus paid it all. God first loved me, and I've responded in faith. Now I'm walking in obedience, and I'm partaking, believing that all that Jesus did on the cross was for me, that I might be rescued, redeemed, and reconciled to the Father that I'm a new creation in Christ, that I've been born again by the Holy Spirit. I'm part of the kingdom of God. And as we partake, we're celebrating the grace of God, the free gift of grace that we receive by faith. Let's just be still in his presence. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, speak the truth of the Lord into our hearts individually, personally, right where we are right now. Lord, as we partake, we're declaring you are faithful and we love you and we'll follow you all the way to the end. By the grace of God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. For those who are serving, please come and distribute the elements, receive them, hold them to the end, that we may all then partake together.